The future is on the margins. <laughs> Good, you all passed. I was concerned for a second there. The future is on the margins. Because the past, for the church, has always existed as a marginal identity. For some reason in the American experiment, for God's purposes, he's allowed us to experience an incredible measure of freedom that 75% of the world does not know. We are the 25% that can worship freely. 75% of the world cannot. And I want to thank Drs. Felch, both of them, for laying an amazing foundation. Because as I looked at this wonderful scriptural foundation for, especially for women, but for anybody who is marginalized by their culture or even by the church, I saw a silver line of history unfolding that cannot be denied. And as I watched Dr. Felch just now talk about these women in the 15th century and beyond, I thought to myself, <laughs> what were black folk doing during that time? <laughs> I couldn't help it, I'm African-American. <laughs> so I was like, well, what, what, what were we doing? And so names like John Marrant came to my mind. John Merritt was born a free man in 1755. He was rejected and persecuted by his own family when he converted to Christianity, born on the shores of America before America was America. This is back when we're all still British, right? 1776, he's born in 1755. His preaching and his missionary efforts as a free black man created lasting bonds between African Americans and the Cherokee people. Have you heard of him? We need new heroes, y'all. <laughs> we need new heroes. Octavia Victoria Rogers Albert, considered one of the most reliable ethnographers, that's recorders of history of the 19th century, an African-American former slave who, after emancipation, went to the University of Atlanta. Put that together in your head. Think about what that took the alabaster boxes that had to be broken to access her education. She conducted hundreds of interviews and recorded the memories of former Christian slaves, while at the same time, with her theological education, helped them understand what had just happened to them. Albert saw the teaching, saw her teaching as a form of worship and Christian service. Mariah Fearing, who made the reverse journey as a, as a former slave uh, in the late 19th century, and a Presbyterian, back to the Belgian Congo, and saved hundreds of young girls from the Arab slave trade in the Belgian Congo, trading scissors, medicine, and then taught them and discipled these girls, so much so that she's remembered in the Congo as Mama Wapmputu, the mother from another land. <laughs> Alonzo and Althea Brown, uh, from 1904 to 1940, they established schools for orphans in the then Belgian Congo. And Althea compiled a dictionary and established a written language for the Bushung people. Amanda Smith, 1837, a passionate evangelist and missionary to Sierra Leone, Liberia, India. She's remembered as a newspaper publisher and for her skill in intercultural relations, which she saw as an extension of her worship of Christ. Dr. Cecilia Fleming, born a slave in 1862, the first African-American woman to graduate from the Women's Medical College at Philadelphia, and a medical missionary, the first black female doctor of the Congo, the first to establish and write and publish about the concept of local care, and trained many more people to treat their own communities and move them toward biblical flourishing so many more names who had been written off by the church by the spirit of infirmitas concili that we heard about yesterday. Practiced as Roman law, but a spirit that still infected culture. 
saying that these kinds of people could not practice Christianity because they were somehow inferior. And this spirit lives on today in the Middle East in the work that I do with uh, women who are coming from Islam. There's a story about a woman named Padina in Iran. And the Islamic system had told her, in the teachings of the Quran and the Hadith, had told her that she was intellectually inferior as a woman. And then she and her mother, she was going to immolate herself. She was going to set herself on fire and commit suicide. She and her mother, thinking that somehow they could be pur purified of the deficiency in their intelligence by this fire. And then they met Christ. And Christ gave them new hope. They met a Christ who was counter to the Muhammad of the Quran. Muhammad never talks with a woman directly in the Quran. Jesus dined with them. They sat at his feet and he taught them. He spoke to them first through the angel when they went to the tomb because they were looking for him, the men weren't. <laughs> he appeared to them first and then to Peter and then to the 12 and to many faithful witnesses. How sad is it when Infirmitas Concili drives the church and denies and looks even more like Satan's attempts to continue to hold people in dehumanized positions. You know, Satan, Satan's limited. He's only got a number of tricks. So, you know, after a while, you start to see the same stuff repeat from era to era, epoch to epoch. God's unlimited in his creativity. He's given man resources to be as creative and create in his image, but we're still limited by the things that he's given us, because we're not unknowing, uh, all-knowing like he is. He's given us, like, you think about music. Uh, 13 notes on the scale, uh, more than that if you count the octave, right? 13 notes on the scale. And look at all the music that's been created and continues to be new stuff all the time. And that's just the Western scale. Satan, on the other hand, God has mercifully limited him. And so you can see the same tricks over and over and over again. And that spirit that Pastor talked about yesterday of declaring a particular people it's not limited to race, and it's not limited to gender. Oftentimes, it's limited to Christian religion. In Pakistan, they live under Jim Crow-like systems. No educational opportunity. Same tricks, just a different face. So we can recognize the rat in the room when he comes in. So these people from the margins have always been my heroes. They've been busy throughout history, and we're busy doing as they have been doing and carrying on the line. And I want to highlight for you, I want to carry on where Doctor finished up earlier, and I want to tell you about some of the African Puritans in America who were also relegated to the margins. Did they exist? And if so, what were they doing? What were they writing? What were they teaching at the time? I'm tall, and I want to, <laughs> I want to make this closer. Is it as tall as that? Hey! Oh, oh! <laughs> that's good. That's perfect. Yeah, that's great. I want to introduce you, thank you, gentlemen, to several precious Puritans, starting with Phyllis Wheatley, who had their ethics and their theology in balance in the New World. And they did not let Infirmitas Concili stop who God had called them to be. They found a place in the underground church in America to express their gifts. We were not always slaves. Race-based slavery was not for a foregone conclusion in early America. Many people don't know that the indentured servants of African descent who came to these shores came on equal footing as the Indian and European indentured servants, but they would hardly recognize their shores less than 100 years later. In just 60 years, they watched their property rights, their access to education, their family stability, their freedom to assemble in worship, ho oh, oh, ho, and on and on be whittled away in less than 60 years. I define marginalization as being relegated to a position of insignificance, devalued importance, minor influence, 
diminished power. Infirmitas conceali. Yet this kind of marginalization strengthened the underground church and sustained the believers through the cultural hostility that gave it birth. Marginalization is a death by a thousand cultural cuts. Soft marginalization of Christian communities doesn't become extreme persecution overnight. It grows in barometric degrees, and you can feel it in the atmosphere. And that's what these African-American slaves and African-American Puritans were beginning to feel in the atmosphere. They're watching legislation happen, and they're saying, wait a minute, what's going to happen to my property? Chattel slavery, the biblical kind of slavery that you read about, he, where he, the, the, I'm sorry, chattel slavery is not the biblical slavery that you read about. It's the place where humanity is denied and destroyed. Biblical slavery, not God's best, never intended in the garden, a product of the fall, but God set guardrails up around it so that humanity would be affirmed and preserved. And it's tough for us to read as descendants of chattel slavery or man-stealing, which the Bible condemns. Anybody who accepts those two systems as equal is suppressing the truth and unrighteousness, Romans 1. But we need to understand the difference if we're going to look at the Puritans and how they were functioning during this time. My understanding is that slavery was more of a repayment system of loans in Rome or the result of war, and even at times voluntary under Egypt. Also, the Bible after the fall shows us God's stipulations on life as regulating sin. Sin was not supposed to be. Just because the Bible records and regulates slavery or any sin doesn't mean God endorses the practice. How many people of us are on Twitter? Okay, retweet does not equal endorsement, right? <laughs> Just because Bible, God reports something doesn't mean that he endorses it. The whole foundation of the U.S. slavery system was ontological racism, which is sin at its core. It is a, an assault against who you are as a person. And even when it's regulated so that the image of God was protected, slavery was less than God's ideal. Ontological racism was the elevation of a people to a godlike status over another group of people. Again, Satan's tricks all over the world. You can go to Africa and see the same thing. It may not express itself as race. It'll express itself as tribe. The Kikuyus run everything. The Luos, all the other tribes in, uh, in Kenya. It's rough for them to get, <laughs> to get there. The, the Kikuyus are the dominant culture. But everybody there is of color. The entire meta-narrative of the Bible endorses freedom from bondage, spiritual as well as physical. That is the ideal, freedom, not slavery. So let me set the stage for you for the 18th century. The only thing I cannot give you is the smell. <laughs> but we're going to go to the 18th century. In 1721, a slave trader named Platon Only requested that the Royal African Company capture 500 small slaves, male and female, from 6 to 10 years old, to be delivered every year on board the slave ship named Kent. Legislation allowing for the capture and sale of African children in the New World this first time will introduce scores of children into these horrible conditions. Have you ever seen the cutaway of an African slave ship? Okay. The children are stuffed like afterthoughts into the smallest, most suffocating areas of a hold in whichever way they'll fit. Now, you've got to imagine, the boat is rocking. Pestilence, filth. You're doing all your business in one spot, and it's rolling back and forth, stomachs coming up into mouths for people who've never been on water before. Weeks at a time children stuffed into these places. And from this pestilence, God raises up a voice named Phyllis Wheatley. She's born in 1754, we think, and she's only seven years old when she makes this trip. And she's going to later chronicle her experience as an American and an abolitionist, but most importantly, as a Christian and as a Christian woman. And I want to introduce you to Phyllis and to look at how faith and scripture and her apologetic skill, that is her reasoning for the faith, helped her reconcile the inconsistency she saw of the culture around her. How the model of Christ 
and providence gave her comfort and how her writing and her divine courage to find her strength and her voice in a place where she should have remained voiceless promotes a revolution that's both temporal and eternal. She writes about her Middle Passage experience to the Earl of Dartmouth. What was it like to come over on the boat? She's writing to the Earl. You ever heard of Dartmouth University? This is that Earl of Dartmouth, okay? His Majesty's Secretary of State for North America. She says, I, young in life by seeming cruel fate, was snatched from Africa's fancied happy seat. What pangs excruciating must molest? What sorrows labor in my parents' breast? Steeled was the soul, and by no misery moved, that from a father seized his babe beloved. Such, such my case. And can I then but pray that others may never feel tyrannic sway? Weedley's brilliance showed at an early age. After she was kidnapped from Senegambia, West Africa, at the age of seven, she was purchased at auction by the Wheatley family, and they named her the same name as the slaving vessel that brought her over, Phyllis. That's where her name came from. And when she came, she was taught the English alphabet by the Wheatley's daughter, and she was going to be trained as a domestic, which, if you understand today, how um, when you, when you hey, I'm sorry to make this comparison, but it's the only way I can and get the idea across. Um, when you purchase a, a German shepherd, you know that that's going to make a good police dog. When you purchase a pit bull, pit bull you know that you're going to get a dog whose jaws lock, and uh, you're going to have to go take you and the dog to the hospital to get. So there, were different, there are different classifications of personalities assigned to different dogs. That is the way that slaves were sold. So that if you knew if you wanted this type of servant, you went to this area. If you wanted this type of servant, you went to this area. This is the dehumanization process that was going on. So they brought Phyllis, who already had a light constitution because of the tribe from which she came, slender build, frail, but then also further damaged by the trip on the Middle Passage on the boat over. So her, the people who owned her realized she was destined for a life of service with a pen in her hand, not a broom. Because, to the Wheatley's credit, they were up north in Boston, and there's no record of how she received her classical education, but solid evidence that she was educated well. She may well have been trained by the religious and theological clergy of New England. And that she was educated well is to the credit of her owners. At least they gave her educational and spiritual freedom, if not physical. It wasn't illegal yet to educate slaves. That hadn't reached Boston. But it was discouraged and seen as impossible due to ontological racism and infirmitas concilia, a perceived intellectual inferiority. Twice subdominant, not just a woman, but a black woman. Sixteen months after her purchase, at age nine, she was reading English with fluency and ease from the most difficult portions of the Bible. By the time she's ten, in addition to reading sacred texts in English, she's ten years old, she masters Greek and Latin. Ten years old. And she's reading Ovid and translating Virgil into English by the time she's 10. By the time she's 14, she's catechized and publishes her first book. A woman who should have remained voiceless. She converted to Christianity formally at the age of 16 and became a member of the Old South Congregational Church in Boston under the ministry of Reverend George Sewell. And then, back then at that point, the tradition and teaching were in the tradition and teaching of evangelical and reformed churches. So she wasn't a Puritan ecclesially, and not necessarily by era, but she was certainly one, she was certainly reformed doctrinally. 1773, her first literary work is published, and it's a small octavo, eight sections of the paper folded, that was sent out to the new colonies and to England. Have you ever heard of a book called Valley of Vision? 
Next, how many of you have, next to Valley of Vision, you have poems on various subjects, religious and moral, by Phyllis Wheatley. Go out and get it. And stick it next to Valley of Vision, because that's where it belongs. It's her first and only book of poems. Her owners helped finance its education, helped finance its publication. And because she is considered intellectually inferior and in the church, as proof of her authorship, the volume included a preface where 17 Boston men approved that indeed she had written this. And she had to have an interview where they made her write in Latin, they made her write in Greek, they made her translate, they made her compose on the spot. And after all of that, they said, okay, we think you wrote it, it's not a fraud. Poems on various subjects is a landmark achievement in American history. And when she published it, she became the first African-American and the first U.S. slave to publish a book of poems, as well as the third American woman to do so. She had two kinds of texts, provincial, which dealt with the local and global issues, issues of the day, that's her blog, right? <laughs> and then her classical works, that's her PhD, okay? I don't know how she did both at the same time. I have, a tr I have a hard time blogging and working on the PhD dissertation. Classical works based on the works of others, like Ovid's Metamorphosis, Virgil's uh, Eclo Eclo Eclogues and Bucolics, uh, the Aeneid, Homer's Iliad, Terence's Comedies. And she wasn't just a writer and a theologian. She was a businesswoman. Her publisher, Archibald Bell, referred to her as the Artful Jade who held back some of her poems so she could create a two-volume set. While she was enslaved, where did the money go? Half the proceeds went from her published works to her, and half uh, went to the Wheatleys, who owned her. Letters to her dearest friend, also a literate slave, show she knew that this poetry, this theology she was writing, her works on Isaiah and other books of the Bible, might be her access to freedom and indeed, people in London, because remember, we're all still British right now, in the London salons were pressuring the Wheatleys to emancipate her. Who were her critics? Her worst critics? The thinkers of the Enlightenment. Now, how about that? Jefferson, John Locke, Benjamin Franklin. As a matter of fact, Jefferson was so hard on her, and I'll tell you why in a second, but he was so hard on her that Oh, the things he wrote were cruel. It's kind of interesting if you think about Jefferson's history. Wheatley's works in the style, is in the style of the Elizabethan and Jacobean English literature. At times, she sounds like Shakespeare and Ford and Marlowe and Davenant and Afra Bain. And some of her pieces are in the Romantic style, and other pieces are like Ovid and the classical Greeks, and others are like epic stylings of Homer from a woman who's ontologically inferior to everybody else. She appealed to the emotions of her readers to demonstrate the humanity of people of African descent, that they shared humanity with Europeans. And she put that together with an argument, actually, for the moral superiority of enslaved Africans to hypocritical Christians. And she transforms what the culture around her said was a deficiency into a virtue. And she did this by claiming authority over her readers, by claiming herself not as a Senegambian, and not as an African, but as an Ethiopian. Why? She assumed a biblical authority over her readers, much like some of the women that we heard Dr. Felch talking about. Moses married an Ethiopian, Numbers 12.1. Psalm 68.31 predicts that Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hands to God. This was a very common technique of the Friends, if you've ever heard of that denomination, that sect. These are biblical counter-arguments to racial self-hatred. She is, her theology is Orthodox Congregationalist, which is presumably Reformed. And here are the common themes that show up in her religious writings. Natural revelation versus special revelation. A transcendent creator God who's sovereign over his creation who's benevolent and omnipotent, biblical inerrancy and authority. She's clearly theistic, and she roundly rejects atheism and deism. Remember, I said Thomas Jefferson couldn't stand her. 
He didn't have an argument to come back. That's my theory. Wheatley's work reflects the themes of redemption, the image of God, original sin, total depravity, suffering for righteousness, something she certainly would have known about, the coming kingdom and the necessity for a savior. And she would have known throughout the abolitionist social circles of Boston that Christians in America preached that the Bible justified slavery. But she had access to the original languages. And she would have seen that this was inconsistent, not only with the teachings of Christ through the Gospels, but through the entire Old Testament. She would have seen, seen that slavery was inconsistent with Old Testament Israel, and she would have pondered the same language of freedom from tyranny that she heard coming from the pulpit by the northern ministers that were encouraging freedom for the colonies from England. Thus, the letter that she wrote to the Earl of Dartmouth. She says, I understand your fight for freedom because I long to be free myself. So when you get yours, <laughs> when you come into your kingdom, <laughs> Set me free, too. She would sit in the, the slave section of the old South Congregational Church of Boston. She would hear this soaring rhetoric of freedom applied to the revolution, but not to her. Now, what can we learn from this community? Because you, you can't look at history just as one person. It's always a group of people around the person, influencing them, opposing them, encouraging them. So there was a community of character around Phyllis Wheatley, and they can teach us something. What they can teach us is the same thing that I learn from uh, the margins of the church around the globe today. And what they teach us is a class. Someday I'm going to do a whole course on this. How to exercise influence when you don't have authority. Wouldn't you sign up for a course like that? <laughs> How to exercise influence when you don't have authority. The first person in Phyllis's community was a guy named Ignatius Sancho. Ignatius Sancho, also an African-American slave, a composer, an actor, and a writer, a neighbor and friend of, the, of Phyllis Wheatley. He was born 1729 on a slave ship. Put that together. That means his mother was pregnant when she was captured. Very pregnant, heavily pregnant. And he was born on the slave ship. Somebody took care of that baby. And somehow he knew the story that he was. So somebody had to have stayed with him to tell him the story of where his parents were. His father jumped over the side rather than be enslaved. His mother died when he was very young. And when he was two, he was sold with, presumably with someone who, was, who cared for him. His owner brought him to England. He worked as a servant in Greenwich and then for the Duke of Montague. And Sancho was an autodidact. That means he was self-taught. And he, was taught to, he taught himself to read and to speak out against the slave trade. And he went on to compose music, write poetry, plays, and theology. 1773, Sancho, Sancho uh, gathers his, uh, his, gains his freedom, and he and his wife set up a grocer's shop in England in Westminster. And he was well known because his shop became a meeting place for some of the most famous writers, artists, actors, politicians, and abolitionists of the day. So when the shop would close, he'd flip the open sign to closed, and all the underground leaders would come. As a financially independent householder, he became the first person of African origin to vote in parliamentary elections in Britain, 1774 and 1780. And after his death, his letters were published in a book, and it became an immediate bestseller. Five editions were published, and his writing was used as evidence to support the movement to end slavery, all based on a theological argument. In 1778, for example, he commented that the main aim of all the English navigators, and I'm going to put it in 1970s parlance, the main aim of all the English navigators was money, 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 money! <laughs> money! Right? <laughs> no, actually, he did. He said, money, money, money is what drives this industry. And he made people aware of how the lives of Africans were made miserable by the slave trade. And this is what he had to say about Phyllis. He was one of the first critics of African descent to praise her. 
He was also the first person of any ethnicity known to question in writing the motives of the Wheatley's owners and the other whites who helped her get her books published. And he wrote this in 1773. Remember, we're all still British, but in case there are British people here, I, I won't do it in my special British accent. But. It says, Phyllis's poems do credit to nature to put art merely as art to the blush. It reflects nothing either to the glory or generosity of her master if she is still his slave, except the glories in the low vanity of having his wanton power in a mind animated by heaven. Splendid, titled, learned names in confirmation of her being the real authoress, alas, shows how very poor the acquisition of wealth and knowledge are without generosity, feeling, and humanity. These good, great folks all know, and perhaps admired, nay, praised genius in bondage. And then, like the priests and the Levites in the sacred writ, passed her by, not one good Samaritan among them. Our second figure is Equiano. You've probably seen him, Morgan Freeman play him in Amistad, right? Born in 1745, a former enslaved African and a seaman and a merchant who wrote an autobiography depicting the horrors of slavery. And he was also a lobbyist in Parliament for its abolition. In his biography, he records that he was born in what is now Nigeria. There is some dispute as to where, where exactly he was born. That's another talk for another day. But after a short period of time in the New World and then in Barbados, Equiano was shipped to Virginia and put to work weeding grass and gathering stones as a child. In 1757, he was purchased by a naval captain for about 40 pounds, and they named him Gustavus Vassa. He was about 12 when he first arrived in England. For part of that time, he stayed at Blackheath in London, and here he learned, again, an autodidact. He learned to read and write and do arithmetic, and he spent a great deal of his time once he was sold again at sea on warships and trading vessels. Uh, he was sold to Captain James Duran, taken to Montserrat, sold to the island, then he sold again to the island's leading merchant, Robert King, continued to save his pounds and his pence, and by trading and saving hard, he was able to save enough money to buy his own freedom, 40 pounds, bought himself back. Came to London, met Phyllis Wheatley and her little group, 1775, he traveled to the Caribbean, became involved in setting up a new plantation colony on the coast of Central America, and from what he knew about the slaving system, he did everything to comfort and render easy the condition of enslaved people who had been brought to work on the plantation. He himself on the plantation was badly mistreated. Uh, they strung him up with ropes for several hours. Somehow he managed to escape in a canoe. What's his connection to Wheatley? He returned to London, and uh, they found uh, employment with a group called the Sierra Leone Resettlement Project, with whom all of these folks were involved, predating Hudson Taylor and missionary activity by more than a few years, by the way. They actually predated George Lyle, too. Oh, oh. So the only thing is, we're not Americans yet. So you can't say they're the first American missionaries. They're just the first missionary activity from America's shores. He forms the Sons of Africa, a group which campaigned for uh, the abolition of slavery through public speaking, letter writing, and lobbying. And uh, then another figure in our community of character was Otobu Kuguano, an African anti-slavery campaigner who worked alongside Equiano. Uh, he played a key part in introducing legislation that meant that if you could get yourself back to England, you could get your freedom, but you could never again return to the colonies. That means either you escaped with your family or found some way to get them there, hard decisions, or you left them. Uh, Kuguano published a book called, and I love the titles of uh, period, of, uh, they're, they're like the names of black Baptist churches, they just go on. That's how you know a black church, when it's like name after name after name after name, you know, the Mount Moriah Missionary Baptist Church or the Perpetual Self, right? <laughs> That's a black church right there. This <laughs> but the, this was the names of Puritan books and, 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 and the, the era after are so long, and his book was called, here it comes, Thoughts and Sentiments on the Evil and Wicked Traffic of the Human Species. That's a short one. 
He was the first published African critic of the transatlantic slave trade, the first to demand publicly the total abolition of the trade and the freeing of enslaved Africans, and he did it from a biblical worldview. He contained accounts of slavery in Grenada that he saw, and he said, argued powerfully that slavery was wrong. He said, how could British people call themselves the most civilized people in the world when they were involved in a trade of barbarous cruelty and injustice and thought that slavery, robbery, and murder were no crime? It is not strange to think that they who ought to be considered as the most learned and civilized people in the world, that they should carry on a traffic of the most barbarous cruelty and injustice. If any man should buy another man and compel him to his service and slavery without any agreement of that man to serve him, now, he understands the difference between chattel and biblical slavery. That enslaver is a robber, he says. It is as much the duty of a man who is robbed in that manner to get out of the hands of his enslaver as it is for any honest community of men to get out of the hands of rogues and villains. As I mentioned before, his relation to Wheatley constitutes some of the earliest missionary activity to Sierra Leone and the resettlement project, which was set up for freed slaves to return because you could be, you could be released and you could end up in a 12 years a slave situation. Overnight, be kidnapped and go from being free to being a slave. Just wake up in the South. Oh! So they would send people to Sierra Leone. Well, by 1775, relations are so poor between England and the colonies that all the mission activity gets suspended. And during the years of the Revolutionary War, people are starting to take sides. You know, they're, they're, getting the, they're reading the blogs on the internet, and they're like, man, I don't know, I might have to side with the loyalists. Oh, I don't know, and these guys are talking about freedom, maybe they'll set us free, the revolutionaries. So they're choosing, they're constantly waiting for news to find out how this decision of the war is going to affect them. Life-controlling, life-defining issues. And Wheatley, at this point, develops an African in America identity, an African American identity, and she sides with the revolutionaries. Now, knowing what I know now, knowing that uh, Britain got rid of the slave trade, abolished the slave trade a couple of generations uh, before we did, I would have probably sided with the loyalists, but uh, you know. <laughs> I'm just saying, <laughs> I can be British if I can be free. <laughs> but that's hindsight. They didn't have the benefit of that hindsight then. One man that also needs to be mentioned in her community of character was a wonderful European, ethical European attorney named Granville Sharp. And he used his legal skills to fight a series of legal battles that prevented enslaved people being taken out of England by force. And he worked with this community, and their underground activity was to take people uh, who, were, who were being sold into or back into the slave trade and make sure that they got to slavery. Now, they could not text each other. This was not happening quickly. This is one letter across the sea. John is in trouble. He needs help. Six, a couple of months later, another letter comes back across the sea. What can we do to help him? Another letter across the sea. Send some money. Another letter comes back. Y'all want us to come? Another letter comes back. <laughs> it took time. Sharp's theology went like this, and you will not find his theology in theological books. You'll find them in legal briefs. Oh, if we had more. Do I have any attorneys in here? Somebody, please. Oh, God bless you. We need more attorneys with a biblical worldview. Listen to his argument. You're going to love this. He says, the now, this is a legal brief, y'all. The glorious system of the gospel. What a way to begin a legal argument. The glorious system of the gospel destroys all narrow national partiality and makes us citizens of the world, obliging us to profess universal benevolence. But more especially, we are bound as Christians to commiserate and assist to the utmost of our power all persons in distress or captivity. Notice here that racial reconciliation was not a goal of this group. It was a byproduct of the good work that they found to do together 
as a community of character. And they were reconciled in the doing of that work. He became the leading defender of African people in London and saved many African people from being sent back to slavery in the West Indies. Well, back to Wheatley, I just have a few more minutes. Granville Sharp was involved in a decision called the Mansfield-Somerset Option that I mentioned earlier, where you could emancipate in London, um, but you couldn't return to the States, or, well, what would become the States, uh, without risking being legally re-enslaved. So she was clever. She was clever about it. She thought about how she was going to get her freedom. Some Christians chose to purchase their freedom, others took advantage of the Mansfield Option. And still others chose to take advantage of the opportunity to escape slavery by flight. Uh, Wheatley apparently chose to purchase the method, uh, she chose purchase the method of emancipation that appeared to grant her the most freedom of movement that she could. So she worked the system. And if you don't believe systems, Satan isn't in systems. <laughs> Satan's in systems because people are in Satan. <laughs> I mean, Satan is in people, rather. She was clever. She had her manumission put in writing. She was a manipulator of words, and she was most certainly a manipulator of people, and I respect her for this. So rather than seeking her freedom as a concession, pressed from now she's owned by Nathaniel Wheatley, the son of the Wheatleys, rather than doing it as a concession by her powerful friends in New England and Mother England, she empowered herself, and she coerced Nathaniel, the son, to exchange one promise for another. And because of the Mansfield-Somerset decision, she had the upper hand. She couldn't be forced back to the colonies from England following the Somerset ruling, but she wanted to stay. She wanted the ability to go back and forth. So she insisted that her master's son give her word in the presence of Granville Sharp that she would be freed if she agreed to return to Boston. So the terms of her freedom, the place, all of them were hers to make. So she, before she goes to England, they, they say, okay, we're going to send you to England with Granville Sharp. And whatever you decide when you get there, We've got it in writing. We'll be cool with it. She, she headed to England. Before she went, she took out an insurance policy on her work to guard against her assets being counted as Wheatley property. And she left a slave on 26 July 1773. And when she returned, she returned a free woman. She referred to 1773 as her Anus Mirabilis, her wondrous year. But freedom, fame, and the hope of fortune yet to come were denied her because, unfortunately, she was now in a vulnerable position. A freed woman of African descent in a world with very few economic opportunities. Wheatleys, the Wheatleys allowed her to continue to live with them after her manumission, but now she supported herself. The father, John Wheatley, dies shortly afterwards. She mourns him as a father. Whoa, what is that? Vince Coretta records that. He's the preeminent Wheatley bi uh, biographer. Susanna, the mother, dies after that in 73, and she stays in a favored place in the Wheatley family. And this, I believe, something radical happened in the Wheatley family. It underscores the difference of chattel slavery and biblical slavery. Somehow, there was some Philemon-type movement that went on in that family. Because by the, time she, by the time she starts to move around because of the occupation of the British in uh, Boston, she moves around with the Wheatley family. And Reverend Lathrop, who is Reverend Lathrop, he has now gone in one generation from being comfortable with holding a slave for life, which was what Phyllis was supposed to be, he's now shifted and he writes this. Reverend Lathrop is the son-in-law now of the Wheatley daughter who taught her how to read and write at the very beginning. And he writes this, I long for the time when war and slavery shall come to an end. Not just war, war and slavery. When not only every sect of Christianity, but Jews and Gentiles, when all nations of men on the face, however differing in color, and in other circumstance, Embrace as brethren children of one common father and members of one great family. I long for the time when all flesh shall know the Lord. Something happened in that family. And I believe it was the Spirit of God. Their spiritual growth 
allowed them to live out Philemon, where Paul implores and says, treat him as a brother, and you know what the right thing to do is. All right, my time is, oh, my time's going so fast. Now that Wheatley is free, she grows more and more bold. She picks up a couple of trolls uh, around her blogging. And uh, an anonymous troll, a satirist, alleges that women who pursue, here we are, back to infirmitous concealing, it's not in law, but it's in the culture. You know, culture doesn't have to be legis things don't have to be legislated for the culture to be hostile towards you, right? Now that she's free, she grows more bold, and her troll alleges that women who pursue intellectual interests, particularly in public, are unnatural, sexually deviant, and lascivious. So he's, he's insinuating in so many words that what this, this group of women poetesses that she's now writing with as a free woman, that they're all sleeping together. Imagine that, what that means in that, I mean, this is 18th century. He criticizes Wheatley's work over and over again. He maligns her character. He writes that essentially by calling her a bull dyke and stud among all the other female poets of the day. And Wheatley claps back on him with this message. <laughs> Much like the uh, clap back that we got earlier today <laughs> through Dr. Felch. She says, I challenge this white-faced, white-livered enemy of modern poetesses. <laughs> Boom. It will be a black affair for him if he ever comes under my leaf, or I will have no mercy on a man who stands up against me on that score. I am a match for the stiffest pedant in the Republic of Letters. He holds up his crest, no doubt, with confidence as he has hitherto met with no rub for his impudence in turning up the frail part of us female poets. But I would have him draw back in time and not plunge too deep into a subject whose bottom his short line of understanding can never fathom. <laughs> I think as we look back over history and we find new heroes, a lot of them were in the underground. It's not limited to this time period. They're all over history. Ethical, Christians whose ethics, how we obey God, and their epistemology, what we know about God, matched. They're everywhere in our history. And as we look back, we have to ask ourselves, particularly in American history, who was the slave and who was the free person? Who was the preacher, quote unquote, and who was the congregant? Who was the teacher? Wheatley stands in both life and death as a revolutionary among revolutionaries. She never once stepped into a pulpit. She wrote to George Washington. They had a correspondence back and forth. And she used what little bit of freedom she had to answer God's call and the gifts, use the gifts that he had given her. Not only did she use them, she honed them. It's one thing to get a gift from God, but it's another thing to get really good at what he's given you to work with. She was a witness of true Israel amidst a nation who understood neither the fellowship of Christ's sufferings nor his greatest command to love your neighbor as yourself. And it's so interesting to me that the general culture of slavery handled and held the holy writ on a daily basis. And they understood only its form while denying the transformational power therein. By all accounts, as an African and a woman and a slave, Wheatley and all the other people that we've heard, the women, the men, all the other people that we've heard about today should have remained voiceless in the world that surrounded them. And yet they all managed to be instrumental not just temporal revolutions, but in eternal ones. They took what they had, what they were offered theologically, and they used it biblically, within the bounds of orthodoxy, and they held the gospel mirror up to the face of the culture around them and said, Christ has a better way. This is the role of the cultural prophet, and this is the role of the use of our gifts. Thank you.